I'm in Umbria, Tuscany's lesser known neighbour region with similar peaks and troughs that slowly descend to blue. But I'm not here for a great walk and this video is not about great places to go hiking. I'm here to see world class art and though it might not look like it, I've come to the right place. Welcome to one of the most important places for the Italian Renaissance, the little hill town of Urbino. If you haven't heard of it, then you're not the only one. In recent times, Urbino has really struggled to escape from the shadows of so many great Italian cities. But its presence on guidebooks is not proportional to its cultural significance. You see, the Duke of Urbino through the second half of the 15th century was one of the great heroes of the Italian Renaissance. His name was Federico de Montefeltro. Here's a portrait of the man. Exhibiting his face and profile, he only displays the left side. The right side of his face was a bit more grisly, having been wounded by a sword in a duel. However, even from the left side, we can still see the bridge of his nose is missing probably slashed away by the same sword which took his right eye. But before becoming the Duke, Federico was first and foremost a Conditeri, meaning the leader of a battalion of mercenaries. So successful was he that he was paid very generously, both by those who asked him to fight for them and by those who bribed him not to fight against them. The last thing anyone wanted in the 15th century was Federico and his troops marching down on their city. As a result, Federico transformed the landscape of Urbino, injecting his wealth into construction projects throughout the city. And this is by far best exemplified by this. The Ducal Palace, a palace that could rival any in Europe at the time. It goes some way in being a decorative expression of the Renaissance style, littered with classical motifs and a meticulous sense of proportion. However, it is really more of a fortress than a palace. It is a weighty mass of hard stone, with turrets and small windows for arches. After all, this is 15th century Italy, and anyone with power is in danger of losing it. But since Federico is a man of taste and a promoter of the arts, where it is possible to render this austere, purpose-built mass with a sense of grace, he does so. However, the most striking feature of this building is its size. It's massive, completely dwarfing the town that it is a part of. Did a small town like this really need such a large fortress? Probably not, but Federico had a large court of philosophers, historians and artists that combined their efforts towards a rapid expansion of human understanding. The size of this building reflects the vast facilities that were acquired for all of these esteemed courtiers including a library that was larger than all but the Vatican's at the time. One man who reflects Federico's Renaissance spirit particularly brightly is Piero della Francesca, and still hanging in the Ducal Palace is perhaps his most extraordinary artistic triumph, the flagellation of Christ. The moment when Christ is whipped before being nailed to the cross a moment of agony that over the history of Christianity has perhaps stimulated the sympathy of the worshipper above all others. Most painters choose to consume the beholder in the horror of the scene. Christ's pain must be vividly experienced, thrust into the viewer's face, unignorable. But Piero is not most painters. This profound moment is in the background. Instead, three figures in lavish 15th century dress have a stronger presence within the scene. It is a quite bizarre creative decision, with a profound effect. This is no longer a tear-jerking scene, meticulously arranged by an artist, but a window into a view of the world. In life a horrifying moment does not rise to meet us, suffocating our view. It is identified amongst a wide visual terrain. Our view is not the most opportune for observing the unfolding narrative because in the real world 
we don't always get the best view. As a result, the whole scene is disconcertingly real, as though we are truly present within it. This work also displays that Piero was as much a scientist and a mathematician as he was a painter. The geometry at work is dazzling. The way the light interacts with every object, every shadow, the ever-reducing size of every floor panel through space is as close to perfection as possible. And then within this world are moments of sheer poetry. The figure in a turban, his drapery writhing, and the tensed hand. The ornate robe of the figure on the right, the triumphal golden sculpture that's tone is starkly out of place in this morbid scene. And then there is the deafening stillness of the whole thing. It is a truly outstanding expression. Another view into a similar world to the flagellation of Christ is presented by this work, The Ideal City. Only this time there are no figures. The subject is an imaginary Renaissance city, a work that Federico would have enjoyed both to see his Renaissance vision realised and also perhaps to aid his imagination as he planned to rebuild Urbino. Like the flagellation of Christ, the geometry is extremely precise, and in doing so, a highly realistic illusion of space is created beyond the two-dimensional painted surface. As we enter Federico's study, it becomes increasingly clear that this is a theme of his Renaissance school. Engraved within the wooden walls are all kinds of staggering illusions. It is as though Federico commissioned artists to employ the latest pictorial techniques so that he could have all his favourite things in his study without the distraction of actually having them there. Protruding out from an artificial bench is a lute. A false cupboard displays an open copy of a still readable piece of music. If Federico is missing battle, well, then his armour is almost in reach. Shame there is no view in this place, but the illusion of one can always be created and then an hourglass and a lit candle that will one day go out, stands amongst a cupboard of books. Time is always going by, and Federico does not have forever to achieve greatness. He must get studying now. But Urbino's fame in the history of art is not only down to Federico. On my right lived Giovanni Santi, who lived here with his wife, and from 1483, his young son, who he named Raphael. Raphael would grow up to be one of the greatest painters who ever lived. Although Raphael had left Urbino by the time he was 17, his potential being too great for a city that was in decline after Federico's death, some of his work does remain in the city. What is believed to be his first fresco still hangs in his childhood home. He probably painted it around the age of 15, Raphael is one of those individuals that make it hard to reject the notion of genius. To paint so well at such a young age is almost mystical. For example, the subtlety in which he has rendered the light veil on the Virgin Mary's head is no minor accomplishment. Some works by Raphael painted long after he left Urbino have also made their way back. His portrait of a gentlewoman hangs in the Ducal Palace and is a beautiful example of what Raphael could do at the height of his artistic powers. The three-dimensionality of her face is built up through subtle variations of shading. The treatment of drapery is delicate, offering resource to imagine its softness. And she seems to emerge gradually from the background. The border between her and the space around is non-existent. Her presence on the canvas is not crudely announced, Instead, she exists gracefully in space. Unfortunately, there are a lot of paintings that you need to see in the flesh to really get a sense of their brilliance, and this is one of them. What I was really surprised to see in the Ducal Palace was these tapestries. They were woven in Brussels and designed by Raphael. It's a long story, but here's the skinny. Pope Leo X commissioned Raphael to make some large sketches, which could be sent to Brussels, where a workshop of weavers faithfully reproduced Raphael's sketches in fabric. It was then sent back to Pope Leo, who wanted them to be hung in the Sistine Chapel, Vatican City, below the most celebrated fresco cycle ever made. So what are they doing here, then? Honestly, your guess is as good as mine. 
I could not find out why they were here, but it was a very pleasant surprise. Whilst a lot of frescoes seem austere, with faded colours, maybe even seeming quite dull, these are still full of life. They depict stories from the lives of St. Peter and Paul, and are covered with fantastic moments and expressions. This scene depicts the miraculous draught of fish, the Bible story of Christ on the Sea of Galilee with James, John and Peter. James, John and Peter had been fishing all night without a catch, but when Christ orders them to let down their nets, they caught so many fish that they needed help from another boat to carry them all. And even then, both boats were close to sinking with all the fish. Jesus then told the fishermen, from now on, you will be catching men. And they became his disciples. The story is told through this tapestry with such clarity. And there are so many details to enjoy. The fish flapping around on top of each other in the boat. The unashamedly idealized classical figures that struggle to raise the net. Their muscles tensed. The reflection of one of their faces in the water and the vast landscape behind. Raphael's figures are monumental, solid and extremely three-dimensional. Their presence is felt by the beholder in a substantial, heavy way. This adds weight to the stories told, and an air of timeless permanence. This is also accentuated by the medium. Each thread of the material holds what is represented in place. There is no movement from slashing brush strokes or ambiguity as to the figure's position in space. They are fixed and still, even though the moment portrayed is volatile and dramatic. So that was Urbino, a city of historical and cultural significance loaded with treasures, only some of which could be captured on this short video. Please like and comment below if you feel compelled. Also stay tuned because there will be more videos coming soon.